Thank you, Dirk. And uh, I'm glad that you love wearing that costume. <laughs> and we're totally we're not forced to do it. Uh, this has been a really great day. I've, it's been inspiring for me to hear these other speakers talk about organic foods and better foods. And it's something I think a lot about. Um, and I, I too am very passionate about organic food. Uh, but today, I'm actually not going to talk about food in general. I'm going to narrow that down a bit and talk only about coffee. And uh, I could talk a little bit about my machine, but I think uh, what I'd prefer to talk about today is something a little even simpler than that, um, is the beauty of coffee. Uh, I find coffee to be a very beautiful, uh, very fascinating drink, uh, plant, sort of passion of mine, and I'd like to share some of that with you. So there are a few things I'm going to talk about today uh, within the beauty of coffee. And earlier I said it, it's sort of a simple thing, and I think that the, the beauty of coffee is in its sort of simple existence. It is just a plant that, that exists, but at the same time, we have such, we as humans have such a complex relationship, a complex and nuanced relationship with this plant. There's so much that we do with it, so such in fascinating ways it integrates with our lives that when you consider these two, sort of the duality of these two, these two things, it's this inc incredible harmony that I find constant enjoyment in studying. Um, so within coffee, I'd like to start by talking about origin, uh, talk a little bit about roasting, the culture that we have behind it, and also talk about brewing. And um, I will do those in no particular order. I think I'm just going to kind of start ranting about coffee. <laughs> so, um, so when I say origin, I don't mean the history of coffee. Origin and sourcing are actually industry terms for where coffee comes from. If you go to a place like Four Barrel or Ritual or Blue Bottle and you ask them, where did this coffee come from? They might say, like, oh, well, let me tell you about our sourcing trip. And this is a really fascinating thing because we're starting to see a new league of cafes that are sort of these super elite cafes, ultra premium coffees, where the, the baristas and the coffee shop owners hop on airplanes and they fly themselves to Ethiopia, to Rwanda, to Colombia, and they get on, they go to these countries, they get on jeeps, they go to the farm, they meet the farmers, and they are looking at the full supply chain of coffee from the moment that the sun meets seeds and dirt to a coffee in your cup. They're looking at that entire experience, and you really, really need to in order to push the boundaries of coffee flavor. Um, I'm fortunate enough to have drank some of the best coffees on the planet and drank coffees from world champion baristas, been to barista competitions, uh, sipped coffees and talked about the aroma and the, the, uh, the taste inside the cup. And, and in all of this experience, I can honestly say, the flavors that are possible in coffee, there's a long tail. Most of the coffee you drink, it's kind of right in here. There's some bad coffees that are you know, pretty bad, but the medium coffees are they're better than the bad ones, but still same ballpark. But when you start really pushing that boundary, when you start drinking coffees where the coffee shop owner has flown to the country and knows the farmer, that is, we're just now starting to push into a whole nother ballpark of flavor. It barely even tastes like, like coffee anymore, uh, or like what you might think coffee should taste like. So when I say there's a long tail, I mean once you start really pushing the boundaries, there is uh, an unknown world of possibilities of flavor out there that we're just now starting to, to break into, and I, I think that's just absolutely fascinating. Uh, so, so back to the origin, uh, what's so cool about the origin of coffee, there are all these awesome stories about people who go to the countries to get their actual coffees. There's so many incredible ways that the coffees will fly from Colombia to San Francisco and how, how that whole thing starts. Um, so first of all, to give a little bit of background on coffee origin. Um, first of all, coffee's a plant. Raise your hand if you knew that. Okay, it doesn't come from space. Uh, I know a lot of us make coffee from plastic pods and then throw them out. Um, uh, it was news to me actually just a few years ago that coffee was a plant. I thought it was this sort of brown caffeine substance that space people brought to us. Like, you know, it, it, it's, we, and that's the extent to which I think we're largely removed from coffee in our culture today. It's something that we kind of just go get, we'll go get a coffee. Um, but it, it, it really is this, this organic material, this organic plant, this organic compound, it's a seasonal crop. Uh, coffees are grown in tropical regions. So within 20 degrees latitude of the equator, north or south, the tropical region, and they're grown at high elevation. 4,000 uh, to six, six or 7,000 feet is the elevations at which you'll find the best coffees. And the, what this means is that when you're looking for a coffee farm, you're looking for a mountainside, like a tropical mountainside. You want it to be sunny during the day and cold at night. And, and the reason for this is if it's sunny during the day, 
and the plant photosynthesizes a lot and starts storing a lot of sugars in the coffee cherries. Oh, by the way, coffee comes from cherries. It actually looks like a red cherry. You can eat it as sweet. Um, and it's the pit of the coffee cherry that is the bean that we eat. So it's sunny during the day. You're on a tropical mountainside. Sunny during the day, it photosynthesizes, stores all the sugar in the cherry. Then you want it to be cold at night. And that, is, and that keeps all those sugars inside the cherry. The plant doesn't use them at night to, to stay alive. It's colder, the metabolism drops. And so you want sunny during the day, cold at night, uh, high elevation tropical region. This is an optimal coffee growing land. And people are now starting to survey land and try to figure out where the best coffees can possibly be grown because they're going to these barista competitions, they're competing in the Brewers' Cup, they're, they're trying to win and they say, we need to get an edge on our competitors, so we're going to survey the globe and we're going to, instead of looking at between 20 and 20 latitude, that's, that's a lot of area to cover, we're going to narrow that down, we're going to start looking at these elevations, we're going to look at you know, these particular weather patterns. And I was actually talking to a coffee shop right here in San Francisco about this very thing and they had an absolutely fascinating story for me that, that really just sparks and, and, and fuels my passion uh, for coffee. And, and their story was, uh, how it went down was I walked in this cafe, I get a cup of coffee, it's a Colombian coffee, and it's caramely. It just tastes like caramel, just like that. And there's some sweet berry notes in the background, and it's good balance, low acidity, and it was one of the top three cups of coffee I've ever had. And, uh, and I started asking questions, because you know, I'm an engineer, I can't help but ask questions. And uh, very quickly, the barista um, exhausts her body knowledge about this coffee, and there are still more questions I have. So she, she calls down the owner, and the owner sits down and talks to me. We talk for a good half hour about this particular coffee, and he, and he says, Jeremy, I, I got this coffee from Colombia, and I know the farmer who grows it, and there's, <coughs> how we found him was we were doing one of these coffee surveys. We're looking in Colombia, we know we like the terroir, the, the soil content of the Colombian region for this particular type of flavor we were going for. We found this one mountain pass that had uh, this weather pattern where it rained just the right amount during just the right time of year. There's the perfect amount of sunlight and it get nice and cold at night. And we're, we're looking at this and we're like, this is going to be a gold mine. This is the end of the rainbow. The pot of coffee gold is right here. And he said, I hopped on an airplane, I flew to Columbia. Once I got to Columbia, I spent several hours on a Colombian highway getting to this mountain pass. And I, I can only imagine that a Colombian highway must be a harrowing, death-defying experience, not unlike driving on the 101 during rush hour. <laughs> uh, so he, he gets on this highway, and uh, he, he, he drives, and gets to the mountain, and he, he gets in his Jeep, and he, he drives his Jeep through the mountains for, for like three or four hours up the mountainside. It's not even a paved road at this point. And he, he, he gets to the nexus of what he thinks is the best coffee brewing area. And he finds a farmer and he says, Sir, I'd like to try some of your coffee. I think it's going to be great. And the farmer tells him, we don't grow coffee. We grow cocaine. <laughs> and it's Colombia, right? So this happens. And he's like, well, you're, you're sitting on a gold mine here. Like, you don't have to grow cocaine. You can grow some of the best coffees on the planet. And, and, they, and he's like, really, the interest is peaked, they form a relationship, and over the next seven years, this cafe works with this farmer directly and converts his entire farm from grow, growing cocaine to growing coffee. And now he, he, does, he can grow, uh, he, he's getting better and better at what he's doing. In just seven years, he's taken his crop from the first crop ever, he's now entering coffee competitions, winning uh, awards for his coffee flavor, he's commanding every year a higher and higher price, and, and as such, before when he was, he was growing this illegal drug was because that was the only opportunity that was presented to him. There was not a wealth of things he could do to feed his family, so he did what it took to do, and you know, it's, it, people do what they have to do to get by. And, and through this relationship with this cafe, through growing specialty coffee, he's able to convert his crop to something that I think provides a lot of value, uh, not only for himself and his family and his community, but for us up here because we get to drink amazing coffee, and also for that cafe because they, they get to be the instigator of all of this. And I, I just, I hear this story and I think about it, and it's, it's a win-win-win all the way across the value chain. And it's this kind of thing with specialty coffee that really inspires me about, about the movement. This movement towards truly artisan coffees. Coffees that are head and shoulders above anything else you've ever tasted. Because you can have this, this kind of win-win-win. You can, you can improve the opportunities for somebody in a developing country. You can serve better coffees to people right here in America. And you can command a higher price for the product and everybody's happy about it. And I just think that's, that's one of the coolest aspects of this movement towards co especially coffee right now. 
And that's just the sourcing of it. <laughs> that's just where the coffee is grown. We're just beginning the story of a cup of coffee. All of this goes into a little cup, just like this. So, so they source this coffee, and I'll, I'll continue on this particular coffee here. They source this coffee, they bring it back to San Francisco, and they, they source it, they process it, and they take those red cherries off of the coffee beans, they dry them in the sun, and they, they ship it out here to San Francisco, and now it's time to roast the coffee. The roasting is the second step in the process. The origin and sourcing of the coffee gives it that foundation upon which the flavor will, will be built. The sourcing, the origin, is where all of the molecules that are ever going to exist inside that bean begin. And then the roasting is where you give a personality, you bring that bean to life. When you get green coffee beans, the green coffee beans that were shipped from Colombia to San Francisco, when they arrived in San Francisco, they were grassy. If you grabbed it and smelled it, it would smell like grass. This is what green coffee smells like. You can't drink it. It's, it's kind of gross. Um, and so that's why you have to roast it. And what happens during the roasting process, uh, I wish I knew more about it. Like, like Dirk mentioned earlier, my expertise is in brewing, not roasting, so I'm gonna have to do a little bit of hand waviness here and say, oh, leave it up to science, and then the rest will figure it out. Um, but roasting is essentially where you take the, the sugars that exist in that coffee bean, those sugars that are stored when it's growing on that sunny tropical mountainside, and you, you heat the coffee bean, and you start to caramelize those sugars. And there's whole, a whole science and art behind constructing the proper roast profiles where you heat it at certain t temperatures and durations and caramelize those sugars just perfectly such that you can get that brown coffee bean that's now brown and lightweight and dry and that you can grind it and make a drink out of it. And that's what happens during the roasting process. But we're still not all the way to the cup yet. You know, we're, we're still just part way down that, that food chain of coffee. Brewing is the last step. So we've taken our Colombian coffee, we've, we've given a, a, new lease, a new opportunity to a farmer, we've brought the, the coffee here to the USA, we've roasted it with some of the best art, artisan roasters right here in San Francisco. Now the time is to brew it. We have a Ferrari of coffee beans. But if you take a Ferrari and you put on Geo Metro tires, it'll look like a Ferrari, it'll smell like a Ferrari, but it'll drive like a Geo Metro. So the brewing is where the rubber meets the road. You have to have a really good brew to make a really good cup of coffee. And when you have all of these three attributes, the origin, the roasting, and the brewing, when you have all of them in perfect harmony, that's where you get perfect coffee. And I, even saying perfect coffee is a little ridiculous. I, I can't say this to someone who's like really into coffee because they'll say, oh, there's no such thing as perfect coffee. All sorts of things can go wrong. What if it rains too much? What if your roast was off a little bit? You know, what if the humidity changed right you know, before you pulled your shot of espresso and threw your grind <laughs> off? There's no such thing as a perfect coffee, but you can get the really amazing coffee, I'll put it that way, if you have all these three things in harmony. From the, the, from the point where the sun meets the dirt to the cup that you're drinking, if you look at that whole process, this is what you can do. And brewing is absolutely fascinating. Uh, I find brewing even more fascinating than all that other stuff before. Th those are cool stories, it's a, you know, it's a cool process, there's biology associated with it, but brewing is where people interact with coffee, and this is where my passion lies. Is how do people relate to the world around them with the coffee we drink, with the way that it's made and that it's brewed and the culture that we have around this. And there's this whole variety of brew techniques. Uh, there is, you know, or, origin, you grow something. Roasting, you heat it up. Brewing, you're essentially just mixing it with hot water, but you could do an espresso and make a very concentrated shot of coffee. An espresso has its own traditions and cultures and even competitions. Uh, and you can take that espresso and you can mix it with a little bit of milk and get a macchiato. Or you can mix it with a little bit more milk and some foam and make a cappuccino. Or you can make it with more milk and a little bit of foam and make a latte. And each of these drinks will further have its own technicalities and competitions and goods and bads. And, and that's just now espresso-based drinks. You can also do brewed coffees. You can do a pour-over with a Hario V60, a Chemex, a Molita, a Kalita pour-over. Uh, you can do a French press style brew. You can do an AeroPress. You can do a cold brew, which is now even fundamentally different. You're not even mixing the coffee with hot water, you're mixing it with cold water and letting it sit for a while. Um, and you can even make a Turkish coffee where you don't filter it at all. It's sort of the most basic of all coffee brewing types. You just put it all in a cup and then drink it. Um, and each of these different brew processes has their own level of technology associated with it, their own cost, their own expertise, its own, its own level of training, and its own culture and history and tradition surrounding it. Uh, and there's no right answer. That same coffee that was grown in Colombia and roasted in San Francisco, well, you can brew it with every single one of these techniques and produce a different cup, and produce a different drink. 
And, and to say which is better than the other one, it's kind of like saying, is chocolate ice cream better than vanilla ice cream? Like, I don't know. Which chocolate are you having? Where'd that chocolate ice cream come from? Is it is it a well-made one? Is it, you know, there there it's apples to oranges at that point. Uh, so <laughs> and a, a fascinating thing I've recently had with uh, uh, coffee brewing is I've, I've been lucky enough to make it to some of these barista competitions. Uh, as it turns out, you can compete in coffee, and you can win, and you can lose, and you can, you can put on a show and you make coffee. And when I first heard about this, and to be completely honest, I was like, this is a little crazy. You know, competing in coffee, like, just sounds crazy. But I went to one of these, I've, I've been to a couple of them now, and it's not crazy. It's, it's absolutely awesome. And you taste the difference between the espresso that comes from the world champion barista, and you taste the difference between an espresso that comes from a shop on the corner, and it is night and day. And then you're just like, I get it. I get why somebody can win at this. Why this, this is a skill that you build up, that you train on. That this can be a career, and more than just a passion or a hobby, this is going to be a career that you can grow with and change with. And I was joking with my friend the other day when I described this to him, and he said, Jeremy, you might think you're a winner. In fact, you might be a winner. But you haven't won a barista competition. And neither have I. <laughs> and, I and he said that to me, I just thought it was the funniest thing. Because um, he's right, you know, it's, it's, this, uh, it's this own little uh, subculture of, of really excellent coffee brewers. Right? <laughs> and so we have this whole vast ecosystem of coffee covering technology in brewing, you know, really high engineering technology where you're doing proportional integral derivative feedback control. You're talking about thermodynamics here, pressures, temperatures, volumes, grind size, ratio of coffee water, high technology with, with coffee brewing. Roasting is, again, high technology, but then there's the traditions that these have existed in our societies for decades, even centuries with certain techniques. Uh, there's the traditions and that human aspect, then you have the biology and the roasting, uh, and then the, uh, the sourcing end, and you have, you're dealing with um, developing nations, you're dealing with local economies, you have an international trade. I can't think of another food product in the world that has such a rich and varied and, and just crazy supply chain and, and mythos behind it than coffee. And in this crazy complexity that we have, as humans, have brought to this simple little coffee bean, this simple little plant that you know one day evolved to become a coffee bean, and one day somebody walked by and ate it, and was like, huh, that's pretty good. I wonder what else could happen with this. And, it, and, you know, and, and in this, this, this reality that we live in with coffee, I find just incredible beauty. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. So thank you. Yes. I want details, like where is this restaurant, what is that Colombian coffee, and what is the best way to make it like a, a drip. Let's say we do just a normal drip coffee. Listen. So those two, where is this amazing cup that you can drive to and have a cup, and how would you brew coffee? It's the best way to go. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I will give examples of a few okay. uh, really amazing places in San Francisco. If you want to drink the best coffee in San Francisco, you got to go to Ritual, Blue Bottle, Sight Glass and Four Barrel. These are my four number one favorites, and they're all absolutely phenomenal. And they all have crazy stories, not unlike the one I just told. And I really recommend going there and asking the baristas where this coffee come from, because you will be, it'll sound like an Indiana Jones film, I guarantee it. And so, so go to one of these places, grab a coffee, and I said, what's the question best? How would you brew how would like I normal, normal drip? I actually uh, just now, so the, the, how would I brew? Now, that's an interesting question because that's actually what my company is focused on is brewing coffee. Um, and my, my belief is that if you want to brew a really great cup of brewed coffee where you can drink a whole cup and not an espresso, um, I've actually done some research on this. And I've found that there are a few key drivers of flavor extraction. And I, when I'm explaining this, I often relate it back. Remember when you were a kid in second grade science class and you had to dissolve sugar and water? And you timed how long it took to dissolve. If you use hot water, it dissolves more quickly. If you stir it, it dissolves even more quickly. Well, then, when you're brewing a cup of coffee, essentially what you're doing is dissolving those soluble flavor compounds and keeping those in the liquid and then filtering out uh, the grind, grinds that you don't want to drink. Um, and as such, temperature and stirring and duration are huge drivers of how much of that stuff gets dissolved and what gets dissolved. So when you want to do the perfect cup of brewed coffee, you want to be looking at these different variables and understanding how they affect the extraction of flavor. And my personal favorite way to brew coffee is on my own machine. 
Um, of course, I think if it wasn't my favorite, then what the heck am I doing? Uh, but what I, what, I, what I build is a machine that you can hold a single volume of coffee, and we have uh, heating elements that control that temperature dynamically during the brew, and we control the very precisely the ratio of coffee to water. We even have a, a component where we can pressurize it to, uh, to account for differences in altitude or ambient barometric pressure. And what we're finding with this system is that you can dial in a brew just like you can dial in a roast, you can dial in a brew to produce the exact flavors that you're looking for. And, um, and so I guess if you don't have um, a crazy science contraption in your backyard like I do, uh, what you can do is take, um, what I recommend doing is taking a, a French press or actually an aero press is what I really recommend, and buying your coffee and brewing it and trying different temperatures and durations and keeping a log in a notebook and saying, here's the flavors I got at this temperature and this duration and do a, a chart where on the y-axis you have temperature and on the x-axis you have duration, and you can dial in in this two-dimensional space where you feel the best flavors extracted. And then once you, once you dial that in, you can do it repeatedly. So you can take those same beans and say, I liked 189 Fahrenheit at a two minute, 30 second extraction time, and that produced these bright citrusy notes that I really like and um, balanced out the acidity and bitter tones, and, that, and that's the coffee that I want to drink. And you can take that same coffee and um, Every morning, brew it that same way and get the same result. And, and so that's what I would do to make your perfect cup of brew coffee. Or you can get yeah. science. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Okay. I have a quick question. Yes. You've seen the competition, they have the baristas who are super natural. If you were to give them, are they that good on any machine you give them? <coughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of like is a race car driver as good in any car? Um, They'll understand principles of coffee brewing. I think people develop an expertise with a particular, like they, they pick their tool and they get really good at it. Uh, to some extent, espresso machines are transferable. Like most, uh, the recent competitions I've been going to, they have, they use Nuova Simonelli espresso machines, which most people don't actually have in their cafes. They, a lot of Zocco is more common, but you can learn the new machine and they practice on it a little bit and transfer to that. Um, but if you're really great at doing espresso, you're not really great necessarily at doing pour over or cold brew, and that's because the way you do these coffees and the way you extract flavors is so fundamentally different. Cold brew is um, you take literally room temperature water and you pour it on top of coffee and you let it sit for 24 to 48 hours. And that's fundamentally different than taking a puck of coffee and compacting it and adding pressurized water over the top at a given temperature and timing the shot and then getting this tiny little bit of espresso. They're as, about as diametrically opposed as you can get. So. In response to your question, I think you, you hone in more on a brew style and then learning the different machines in that space, and, and that becomes your thing. Yeah. Do you compete? <laughs> uh, I actually did. I competed in the AeroPress competition. Um, and the AeroPress is this kind of quirky invention from a Stanford professor that is um, similar. It's like a cylinder uh, with a filter on one side, and, and you can do exactly what I was describing, where you can meter these different variables. Um, and I, I did compete with the AeroPress competition. Uh, it was a it was some stiff competition, there were heats of three, and only the first from your heat moves on to the finals. And in my heat of three, I like to tell people I got second place. <laughs> uh, so I, I did compete, I, I didn't win, uh, it was my first time, but I had a great time with it and I got to meet uh, some coffee celebrities in the process, and that was just um, a really awesome experience for me, and I totally loved it. And I do recommend getting involved in this kind of thing, and uh, going to these barista competitions. People are super friendly, they just love to talk about coffee, um, much like I have been talking now, and you'll have just an amazing time. I really recommend it. Yes? I have a question. Um, you were talking about this curve <coughs> with the bad coffee and the good coffee and the middle coffee and the middle. Uh, what the good coffee is it for a normal coffee drinker? Can we actually taste the difference? Or Yeah, absolutely. So is it kind of like wine where you like to say, wow? Um. I actually, so I have more experience with coffee than I do with wine, of course. Um, but in, even in just talking to people, I've taken a wine tasting class before, and I was kind of getting into wine for a little while. I consider it cross training. Uh, but <laughs> thank you. I was hoping somebody would get that. Um, and what I found with, with coffee is that it's actually easier for people to identify a really good coffee as opposed to an okay one. In fact, I'd say that everyone in this room is capable of going to Ritual and ordering their $5 cup of pour over. And you know, even forgetting, even in a double blind taste test, forgetting that you got 
this coffee that's been sourced with this whole ornate process and brewed by a trained professional who's been practicing for years sometimes to do this better. Forgetting all that, even in a double blind taste test, you could take this cup and you could put it next to um, a cup of coffee from like a large chain or that wasn't prepared in a particular way, and you will know. I'm not a super taster. I'm, I'm a regular guy um, who has just found a passion for this and through practicing and going out and doing, tasting different coffees, I have developed a, a knowledge for it. Uh, and part of the reason for this is actually fundamental at the um, sort of molecular level. Uh, red wine has about 300 identified flavor components, and coffee has over 800. Uh, so right there, you're dealing with a much more complex drink. There's a lot more going on in it. And um, this is both a blessing and a curse for coffee. It's a blessing now, because we're just now learning how to deal with this complexity and to extract what we want and produce cups that are actually superior. But I think it's hurt it in the past because before we had reasonable temperature control technology, it was just impossible to do anything with this. People would pour boiling water on black roasted coffee and then say, this tastes like tar. And it does uh, when you do it like that. But when you, when you dial in your roast to this perfect medium, like golden brown, and when you dial in your brew to that right, you know, warm, not boiling, but nice and hot, temperature and you get the duration right in there, you then all of a sudden reveal this, this hidden potential that's hidden right there with inside the coffee bean and, and that's where you really taste the difference. Uh, wine being, a, you know, in, in terms of just total flavor components, a less complex uh, beverage and also having a longer tradition with wine cultivation and um, you know, wine cultivation and, and drink wine crafting uh, has developed this community around it before coffee has. I think we're right now at the forefront of a uh, holistic industry-wide revolution in the way people consider coffee and, and drink it and the way they brew it and the way they think about it. So. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you.